We're live now, as usual. We'll wait just a second to make sure that we get everybody moved from one session room to another. Thirty-two. That looks good. I think. I think we're all here. So, welcome back to the next talk, the uh, the fourth talk of today. Um, I am pleased and honored to present uh, uh, Sarah R. Davies, who is a, a professor of techno science, materiality, and digital cultures. I just said super cool job title uh, at uh, at the University of uh, Vienna. And uh, I'll be talking to us about academic Twitter, social media practices, and the enactment of contemporary academic work. So more uh, picking back up on some of these threads about social media from earlier in the day. I'm really excited to see uh, to see how this how this unfolds. Thanks so much. Please uh, please take it away. Super. Thank you. Um, so of course I want to start by saying thank you um, to Charles uh, for organizing such a fantastic conference. I've really been enjoying. Um, listening to engaging with uh, works that I would not normally come across. Um, so this has been very enlightening for me. I, I particularly enjoyed the visualizations yesterday, um, really beautiful. I, I sadly cannot compete. I have no visualizations, but I do have grumpy cat. Um, so I offer that to you uh, as at least some kind of visual entertainment um, for this talk. Okay, so I am... Um, uh, as you saw on the first slide, based in the Department of Science and Technology Studies uh, at the University of Vienna. And I want to talk to you about work that is looking at um, broadly at digitization within scientific practice, um, and particularly uh, thinking about social media and what is happening in some of these social media spaces. Just to give you a sense of where I will be going, uh, I want to essentially make two arguments. Um, and I will do this in four parts. So the arguments that I want to, um, to share with you, to suggest, firstly, I want to start by saying that we cannot clearly distinguish between epistemic and other kinds of practices, um, including digital practices. So I want to argue that there is um, continuity between um, epistemic work and the other kinds of work, the other kinds of activities that go on um, within the university, within academia. Um, and I will, of course, say more about that in a moment. The other argument, the other claim that I want to, to, to make is that um, academic social media enacts the academy in particular ways. Um, so this is from looking at social media, from looking at Twitter specifically, we see um, imaginations, performances of the university, of research and academic life that are done in specific kinds of ways. And again, I will flesh those, um, those ways out for you in a moment. So those are my conclusions or my, the things I want you to take home from this presentation. Um, I will do this in four parts. Firstly, starting by um, thinking about some backgrounds, digital practices in the contemporary academy. I will briefly introduce the study on which I'm drawing. Um, I'll then talk about empirical findings from that. Uh, and then at the end, I want to circle back to some of these wider claims or um, discussions that I want to speak to. Um, so to look at the more specific empirical findings in the context of thinking about digital science. Uh, Charles, I should have said this to you before, I really encourage a strongly interventionist approach in um, timekeeping on your part. Uh, I'm afraid I'm not quite sure how long this will take. I'm, I'm happy to give you, a, to give you a, a, a warning or two, not a problem. That would be great, thank you. Um, so what is my starting point here? Uh, I'm coming from Science and Technology Studies, SDS. Um, a really, I think, a fairly unproblematic claim in that domain is that we cannot readily distinguish between epistemic and other kinds of practices. Um, so knowledge production is always entangled with other uh, ways of being, other kinds of um, uh, contexts and cultures, um, such as um, different kinds of value systems or different forms of sociality. So this is my starting point. Um, in particular, I'm drawing on work within STS that has been concerned with the conditions of contemporary academic work, um, the contemporary university, and has thought about how um, these conditions are interacting with shaping epistemic practice and knowledge production in um, all kinds of different ways. 
Um, so for instance, um, there has been work that has looked at um, new regimes of accountability and evaluation that are emerging, the way in which we, um, our work is measured, our performance is um, evaluated. Um, so that's one, one way that perhaps goes into shaping the conditions of work and the way in which we can produce knowledge. Um, but at the same time, um, there are also things like the rise of internationalization, um, increasing precarity in academic labor, um, and very particular and distinct imaginations of what it means to be a good academic um, and to have a good or right kind of academic career that come perhaps from policy and funding frameworks. So all of these things make up um, the context in which we live and work uh, within the academy, um, and uh, I would suggest a shaping um, how we can produce knowledge um, and also the kind of knowledge um, that is um, that comes out of universities. So one way of thinking about this is using the concept of epistemic living spaces, uh, which was developed by um, two of my colleagues here in Vienna, Uli Feld and uh, Max Vochler. Uh, and with this notion of the epistemic living space, they really try to make clear the constant intertwining of epistemic with other kinds of um, aspects of academic experience. Um, so here they say by epistemic living space, we mean a researcher's perceptions and um, narrative reconstructions of all the structures, contexts, rationales, actors and values, um, which mold, guide and delimit their potential uh, actions. And this kind of process of molding, guiding, delimiting, this is about um, what these researchers know, what they imagine being able to know, um, as well as how they act in social contexts. So again, just to, just to make the point uh, one more time, um, this means that within uh, STS recently, a central question has been, how are the conditions of academic life intertwined with its products? How are researchers epistemic living spaces changing and um, developing um, within the current uh, way that the academy is, is developing, is managed, is organized and sought about? So what does this, um, how does this relate to the digital? Um, so of course, digital practices and digital science are one key aspect of contemporary academic experience. And this means I would argue that when we think about digital science, um, we should be concerned with the full range of the diverse ways that digital practices are present within uh, academia. Um, so we should think about digital science, um, we should think about digital methods, um, but we should see those within a wider context in which um, diverse forms of digital practices are present, diverse forms of um, other kinds of social and cultural practices are also present. What does this mean uh, in practice? What am I interested in specifically? This means um, to take an example from my own work, my own uh, experience. This means that I think we should consider the way in which digital tools uh, and methods uh, involved in epistemic practice and in knowledge production. For me, for instance, I use um, the qualitative analysis software MaxQDA. Um, this is one way in which my knowledge, um, my knowledge making, my, my research is shaped and structured um, and develops. Um, so we should think about these tools and um, methods. We should also, I think, think about, consider the way in which our interactions are structured through digital platforms, such as the one that we are on right now. Um, and the way in this is, the ways in which this may be shaping how we engage with each other, how we collaborate. So for instance, if this is a screenshot from a, a research group meeting uh, that I'm involved in, um, what difference does that make to the way in which we as colleagues um, interact and, and produce uh, knowledge together. So my great job title includes the word um, materiality. I also want to suggest then um, that as we think about these digital um, platforms, as we think about digital tools, we should also see them within particular material contexts 
Um, so this is my desk uh, at which I am currently standing. Uh, so when we investigate digital practices, we should see them um, as particular configurations of devices and bodies uh, and spaces. Again, we should contextualize digital practices and digital methods um, uh, within the space in which researchers are working. Finally, um, or, or one other example of what it means to think about digital science in this broader context is to include social media practices. So to acknowledge that um, much um, research engagement, um, but also much sense making about the contemporary academy goes on through um, social media, through different kinds of platforms uh, and ways of contacting um, uh, and being in touch with each other. So this, it, for instance, is a screenshot from the Shit Academics Say um, Facebook page. So this means, if we draw this together, the central question that I am concerned with, not only in this talk, but as a part of a broader research agenda, um, is how do diverse digital practices intersect to instantiate the contemporary conditions and knowledge products of academic life. So what are the interactions between all these different engagements with the digital that I've just talked about um, and the kind of knowledge that is made as well as the experience of being, uh, being a researcher. In the context of this presentation here, um, I want to narrow down on a more specific um, aspect of this to drill down a little bit into social media practices as an example of this wider engagement with um, the, di the diverse and kind of multifarious aspects of digital science. So here I want to ask the question, what can social media practices tell us about the contemporary conditions and knowledge products of academic life? The way that I will reflect on this question is using um, a data set from academic Twitter that was drawn from almost exactly a year ago. Um, so here I am using the pandemic or specifically the first months of the pandemic as a moment of crisis or breakdown that allows us to study exactly what it is that is framed as in crisis or, or breaking down. Um, so the pandemic um, can be understood as a lens through which to consider what we see as normal, what is being disrupted, um, what is being broken. And I am interested in how academia and academic life were performed on academic Twitter during, as I say, the early months of the pandemic. I take an analytical approach that is ethnographically oriented. So I'm interested in actor terms uh, and meanings engaging with the ways in which particular cultures are making sense of particular things. Uh, so this is qualitative research. Um, and uh, I, I view social media material as kind of records of digital practices. In practice, this means that I am working with a relatively small data set from uh, Twitter. It had to be relatively small because I wanted to do fine grained um, qualitative analysis. Uh, so a year ago, I used um, the tool Tweet Archiver to um, download uh, tweets and to create a data set of tweets that use the hashtags uh, academic Twitter or academic chatter and which were published between March uh, and July. So this data set was then hand curated um, to uh, focus on tweets that were popular, that had been favorited um, 25 or more times, um, and that focused particularly on um, the pandemic. Uh, and this um, data set, which um, came to between three and 400 tweets, I'm afraid I can't remember the exact number right now, uh, we're subject to a thematic analysis, so looking at patterns and themes, as well as a more focused multimodal analysis where I was interested in um, the use of images and memes and video, um, and also something about uh, contextualization of particular um, uh, tweets. 
I, I should acknowledge uh, right at the start that this is a data set that is um, limited along, multi uh, along multiple dimensions. Um, uh, it, it was a response to a particular moment uh, and actually to my own observations of um, the way in which social media was being used uh, this time a year ago. Um, and it means um, the, the terms that I focused on or that I came to, to focus on um, academic Twitter and academic chatter. This is a kind of community within Twitter, but it of course excludes other communities. Um, the hashtag black in the ivory tower, for instance, and also PhD chat. So this is a very kind of delimited data set that has been subject to um, fine grained analysis. Um, so I don't want to make too, too strong claims uh, for this. It's about the way a particular group within the academy choose to speak to each other. So um, there are problems also with using material from Twitter um, without any kind of informed consent procedure. In the past, I think this kind of social media material has been treated as in the public domain, uh, but more recently this has been problematized, uh, rightly so, I think. Um, so here I don't want to um, directly quote too much. Um, I will reference only a content that I view as viral that has achieved kind of um, hundreds and thousands of, um, of likes or favorites. Uh, otherwise, I tend to paraphrase um, uh, the material that I'm, I'm drawing on. So what comes out of this data set? As I say, I was interested in um, how academia, how academic life were being um, performed, discussed, um, represented um, within this material. Um, and I was curious about both the themes and patterns that emerged, uh, as well as the ways in which these um, themes and patterns were instantiated through, for instance, um, the use of, of visuals. So the first kind of um, theme or idea I want to, to mention is the notion of disruption. Um, of course, I think this is not so surprising <laughs> to us. Um, uh, this will be something that probably we all remember um, and, and is definitely true far beyond academia. So a lot of the content was talking about um, uh, disruption, chaos, crisis. The interesting question becomes then, what is it that is being disrupted? Um, what is the normality that is being disturbed um, through uh, the pandemic and the, the various lockdowns uh, and other effects that that had. So what we find is a picture of um, normal academic life being disturbed through things like homeworking and homeschooling, also through the sudden removal of conferences and the lack of face-to-face -face contact. So this was something, something that was seen as normal, uh, valuable in academic life uh, that was being um, stopped, disrupted. Perhaps um, what is more surprising or more interesting is that there was also a sense that what was being disrupted by the pandemic um, was production, essentially productivity. Um, so one thing that people spoke about was um, a concern often that being productive, being efficient and effective, this was being disrupted through um, working from home, not being able to access the lab, for instance. So there's a sense that normality um, at least should aspirationally involve um, pro being productive, uh, kind of systematic and efficient, um, con continuous production of um, data sets or texts or, or results of some kind. But I think what is also interesting is that this, um, these notions of productivity um, or complaints about these disruptions were articulated um, in particular ways, um, often using humor and um, jokes and memes. So this wasn't something that was simply described, it was instantiated um, through these kinds of um, forms and genres. Uh, and this does particular work in terms of, um, uh, in terms of the language, in terms of the, the way in which these subjects are approached. 
um, the use of this kind of lighthearted, ironic um, attitude. Um, this both somehow reinforces particular imaginations of academic life, um, while also being able to gently subvert uh, and distance oneself from them. So this is just one example for you, one uh, additional bit of visual stimuli, um, stimulation. Uh, this uh, was definitely something uh, that went viral in terms of popularity uh, and reach. I guess um, many of you may well be familiar with it. So this is an adaptation of what is known as the unfinished horse drawing meme uh, applied to teaching university teaching in 2020. So the sudden move to uh, remote learning that I guess many of us um, uh, had to go through uh, a year or so ago. And so this meme um, really captures, I think, these dynamics that there is um, humor, some kind of ironic reflection on the fact that um, you may have had grand plans for the semester, but these have just kind of fallen to pieces and become more and more rudimentary. Um, so here you exactly see this um, uh, reference to kind of academic ideals. All of our teaching should look, um, so to speak, like the back end of that horse. Uh, it should be this polished, um, uh, effective, dynamic um, form. Uh, so you have these ideas being referenced, but you also have a kind of acknowledgement um, of the ways in which the, these are not being lived up to. So it's a first theme. Um, is something about uh, the normality that is being disrupted. Um, the second theme is one that, um, that focuses on care and um, portrays the academy as a, a space that is deficient in care, essentially. So this material frequently features expressions of compassion, uh, emotional honesty, care, uh, and also involves offers or requests for support, empathy or advice. Again, this was a very um, popular um, tweet uh, um, advising um, faculty members to check in on your PhD students. Um, many live alone with supervisors are the closest they have to a family. So encouragement to express care, to look after people. And what you get from these kinds of expressions, these kinds of articulations of, um, of care, is a sense essentially that they, this encouragement um, to care it is required. Uh, academic life, normal academic life um, is lacking in these kinds of um, activities, these kinds of mutual support uh, and encouragement. So by referencing care so much, you build up a picture of the university as not often um, including that or needing some stimulation uh, for that to happen. So in this context, um, jokes and memes were perhaps unsurprisingly less important, less dominant. Uh, instead, content had um, quite a distinctive emotional repertoire. Um, so you have um, not only these articulations of care, compassion, um, uh, the desire to look after each other, um, but you also saw um, things like gratitude, celebration, and motivational language. These are a couple of examples, not from my data set, um, things that I have taken from um, more recent um, uh, um, tw tweets. Um, again, that have been um, favorited many uh, times, uh, but uh, that captures some of this kind of, um, uh, so some of, of this style, some of this way of talking and interacting. Um, so the piece of advice, um, we're all smart here, distinguish yourself by being kind, um, and also kind of acknowledging and celebrating the decision, uh, that the decision to quit academia uh, may be a good one. Uh, so again, I did like encouragement, um, focusing on the right kind of interpersonal relationships. These are exemplary of the, the way in which these tweets uh, in my data set uh, were also um, the language that they used. I'll let you know you have about about 20 minutes left in the whole session, just for a time okay. point. 
<laughs> this is my last empirical point. Oh, cool. Um, so, um, as well as suggesting a kind of deficiency of care, um, there was another theme uh, which was more kind of um, politically conscious. Um, and this came through as uh, at the promotion of or, or discussion of critique. Um, so tweeters also drew attention to inequity and injustice. So this wasn't just about caring, it was about pointing out the, um, the different kinds of structures that were seen as responsible for this inequity. So for instance, this came through in things like um, the different access that students had to technology for um, home learning uh, and diverse home situations, the gendered challenges of working and teaching from home, uh, cases where mainstream media focused on work by men ignoring women, um, and drawing attention to the ways in which casual academic staff were particularly badly uh, affected. So interestingly, the notion of productivity also re-emerged here um, because these ideas of the necessity or the importance of productivity were seen as a key site where um, inequity became apparent. Um, the sense that if you were um, living in a situation where you have a very poor um, internet connection, where you're caring for, for many people, where you're trying to homeschool your, your children, um, you're simply not able to view the pandemic as a holiday from the lab and be super uh, productive and effective. Um, so by incorporating this thread of critique, um, this material performs the academy um, as being flawed not only through this deficiency of care, but through a kind of entanglement with um, wider social inequality. Okay, so very, very briefly, I want to circle back around um, to the wider context with which uh, I started. Um, so I just sum up for you there um, the themes that I've uh, talked about um, and also the ways in which they were instantiated in the material. So I think what we can say then is this material does sell, tell us something about how the conditions of academic life uh, are enacted by this specific community and also the styles and norms through which they, um, they talk about academic life. Um, so here the academy is framed as deficient in care, as focusing perhaps too much on productivity um, and as being entangled in, in social um, inequity. Um, and it does this using these kinds of particular emotional repertoires um, as well as this distanced ironic humor. So this is something about the kind of very um, specific and detailed um, work that is done in this particular social media space. As I say, I also want to, to start to think about what this means for how we think about digital science, um, digital research, digital researchers um, more generally. And I'm afraid I don't have any answers. I, I only really have more questions um, in thinking about this. The first of which is how do these kinds of practices relate to other digital practices in science? Or more specifically, how do these genres and norms, the ways in which people interact and talk, how do they travel? How do they intersect with other kinds of spaces and interactions within academia? I think we should also um, reflect on um, if the academy is um, enacted in these ways as oriented to productivity as deficient in care. What does this mean then for this um, question of um, knowledge production? How does the conditions or how do these um, portrayed conditions come to matter in terms of the kind of knowledge that can be produced, the ways in which it is done so, um, and the kinds also of relationships that are um, in collaborations uh, that, that become possible. And finally, um, just to reflect a bit on this um, use of productivity as a central frame uh, in this academic practice becomes about producing things, often things that are um, evaluatable, right? That can be used to produce metrics, whether that is an H index um, or a, a positive um, tenure review evaluation. So if we think about this, 
um, notion of productivity as somehow dominating people's experiences or how they talk about the university. Um, again, what does this mean? Um, what does it mean for knowledge production? What does it mean for what is not being valued? What is not being um, uh, encouraged or, or um, allowed to, um, or able to be visible um, within the university? I apologize for the um, rushed presentation uh, and the lack of um, cat memes. Um, I very much look forward to questions and comments. Fantastic, thank you so much. Um, one question already here. I have I have a lot of my own, but I'll I'll I'll, I'll start not 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 that way. Um, so first, were the uh, just a, a bit of a data set clarification. So were the tweets only in English, and also, do you have an idea of their geographic distribution? Um, I think they were only in English. Um, so the hashtags that I use, academic Twitter and academic chatter are obviously in English. Uh, sometimes other, I, I mean, if you look, if you look now at those um, hashtags, occasionally um, people will use those and tweet in other languages, but at least in the, the data set that I was looking at, which had these 25 or more favorites, so they were more kind of visible, um, they were all in, in English. Oh, and geographical, um, I, I'm afraid that is, of course, in the giant Excel spreadsheet that I have, um, but I haven't looked at this at all systematically. Um, my impression, um, or, or my, um, yeah, yeah, my impression from the data is that it was largely kind of US um, based with, with a few, um, with a few other places included, but this is not from any kind of systematic analysis. Sure. Um, did you look into, uh, this is a question from, from Rose Trampas, did you look into gender with the care tweets of, of, the, of the tweet authors, or is that too hard with the data set you have? Um, I, I mean, no, I haven't. Uh, again, it would be possible, um, but I haven't got to that kind of stage of the analysis yet. Um, I would also, um, yeah, well, I, sh I can also kind of send out a plea. Um, I am a, a, a ethnographer, a qualitative um, researcher by training and background. Um, this has been, if, even this kind of analysis working with uh, material downloaded has been a learning curve for me and I have felt very limited by my um, kind of lack of methodological expertise. If people have ideas they want to share with me um, or are interested in collaborating, I would be really delighted to, to hear from you because um, this has been something that I, you know, I have this, I think, very rich material, but it's been hard for me to to know how to work with this, um, for instance, in looking at these categories um, more systematically. That's actually a nice segue into it. So, so I wanted to ask a slightly, a slightly broader question, um, just because I, I imagine that I'm not the only person who's in, who's in the, something like the following position. So there are interesting questions that I think I might be able to, to get interesting and analytic traction on using social media data. Um, what have been some of the kind of unexpected troubles that you've run into? What's, what are, what are, if, if someone's thinking about uh, uh, picking up an analysis like this, and, and I think this might be especially valuable feedback from you since you, as you say, you're coming to this as well from sort of the outside. I wonder what, I wonder what kinds of, of, of things you ran into that you weren't expecting or, 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 or along those lines. Yeah, I, I mean, one piece of advice is not to do this in a pandemic on the spare of the moment. Um, I, I mean, I really would have benefited from more research and thought in advance. Um, I, I had to kind of develop a, a method very quickly. It, so of course, I think there are lots of resources out there. I, I guess one thing that has surprised me, um, again, coming from a qualitative background, naively, I just thought, okay, there will be this tool and it will magically download all this data and it will be very tidy um, in this beautiful spreadsheet. and. Um, and then I'll just put it into a, another software um, and it will just be very smooth and, and seamless. Um, I, I mean, this relates a bit to the presentation, I think yesterday about masking and, and metadata um, because I was really surprised, I have to admit how much 
curation this material required um, uh, and how much work it was to get a data set that was um, it was it was kind of standardized and possible to work with and didn't crash my computer when I opened the Excel file. Um, uh, so this was something definitely that surprised me and I yeah. I just want to, there's actually, uh, this isn't even really a question. I just want to list there, there's really cool stuff happening in the chat. So let me just kind of share what people are saying. So yeah, R Rose, uh, uh, or no, sorry, Arlie, Arlie Belvo uh, picked, uh, picked up with uh, saying, yeah, demographics of, of the care data set would be super interesting, especially um, if you were doing a kind of comparative uh, uh, approach, for instance, with uh, say the black and the ivory hashtag or the native Twitter hashtag, right? To see if there's, there's interesting shifts going on across those different communities. Um, uh, Eugenio Petrovich adds adds that, that that also might be an interesting way to uh, to assess if the data set somehow biased by 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 language, by geography, by scientific field. If there's ways that these that these that these cut uh, uh, these categories are cross cutting, uh, and and Arlie Belvo adds there was a really cool conversation about fatherhood happening in one of our Zoom breakout rooms during our social hour last night. Uh, apparently, I missed that unfortunately. But yeah, I bet there. She says I bet there really mentioned uh, this. I bet there was mentioning trends happening. So uh, 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 so that 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 yeah, I think there's 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 an appetite for this. Um, that's, uh, I think, I think it's really, it's really interesting to, uh, really interesting to see what may be possible with it. A more, uh, a more precise question here, here as well, uh, uh of another follow-up from Rose who asks, who says, uh, I forgot to, oh, says, first of all, I forgot to say really nice work. Um, and then adds, I'd be interested if you've got any opinion about maybe if there's stuff that doesn't get said in the tweets, stuff that doesn't get tweeted about, like, uh, quiet thanks to great universities that extended deadlines or made uh, clear decisions early, right? Where people maybe feel awkward about saying that out loud. Yes, thank you. Really nice points. I, I mean, actually, thanks is one thing that I think does come up a lot because of these genre norm, norms about gratitude and motivation and positivity. So people do, in this material anyway, kind of say thanks to their supervisor or to um, or acknowledge um, the good work that a particular institution is doing. But I think more broadly, one thing that is extremely interesting is how these norms, so for instance, around the use of humor and this ironic distance, and also this repertoire that is all about gratitude and positivity and thanks and care. I, I mean, the, these norms do, I think, shape what is, um, what is sayable. Um, uh, and again, this is not something I've been able to develop, um, but I am curious, for instance, in the comparison between um, coffee room conversation um, in a department or a university, how does that look different? Um, kind of what, what is talked about differently in, in these different kinds of, of spaces? I mean, one thing that is interesting, also this critique notion, this is generally, again, in this material, critique that is directed at the, the superstructures of institutional life. So it is about the university, the government, um, Trump, um, you know, really kind of quite high level critique about inequity. What happens much less, um, and this might also be to do with the fact that I'm looking at frequently favorited tweets, uh, what I find much less is kind of personal complaints, like, my department X has treated me Y really badly and I'm pissed off. I mean, this doesn't appear so much. Um, so I also think there's something about these norms that um, perhaps being uh, presenting yourself as complaining or um, dissatisfied, that somehow doesn't fit into what is the, um, the standard practice uh, within this space. Yeah, that that actually connects to something that I was that I was wondering about. That I, I have no clear opinion on this, but I, I wonder how to. So of course, especially Twitter, I feel like you know Twitter culture is sort of infamous, right? That there are there are some of these norms are platform organic instead of being academia organic, and then trying to think about you know disentangling those in these in these kinds of contexts. Um, uh, this especially occurred to me with uh, you know the, the 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 first the first set of points about about the kind of 
we have to be lighthearted, semi-funny, but ironically detached from everything. And I was sort of thinking to myself like, yeah, so like when you tweet about anything, that's sort of how you have to be, right? That's sort of what everyone is expecting of you. Um, so I, I, I wonder about, about, that, about that interface. Uh, if you've had thoughts about how to separate those, those variables for lack of a better way to put it. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm not sure how to separate them essentially, but I would agree this is a genre norm that is about Twitter. Um, yeah, rather than or as much as academia. And this again is partly why I'm interested or I'm very curious about the ways in which these um, social media forms of interaction are now becoming part of, of other spaces, right? Um, so for instance, I think we use the language of hashtags um, outside of Twitter now. Um, people, you know, use this ironically hashtag whatever. Um, we also talk about things being on and offline. Um, this, of course, is a much bigger um, kind of linguistic project, um, but it's one thing that I'm curious about in the context of academia specifically. Um, do we now start to do our coffee room conversations now start to take on some of these dynamics that come from social media? Um, yeah, I'm not sure. This is very much a kind of speculative and open question. That's a really, yeah, yeah. That's a that's a really provocative way to think about it. it these uh, the the uh, the living spaces cross cross cutting and interacting. Um, oh yeah, and actually, and, and Stefan Hesbruggen uh, uh, adds that some of these social media norms, in particular, about about certain kinds of of. I, I, I don't know where the tape delay is, but I assume he's mentioning sort of direct attack on your university, for instance, uh, maybe the kinds of things that are enshrined in university so, social media policies that are regulating the behavior of employees, at least on occasion. I don't, I'm not, I, I don't a priori know how widespread those are, but. Yeah, I mean, I think they are increasingly widespread. I have to say, I'm not sure. What I'm less sure about is how enforced they are. Um, but but you're right. This could involve yeah. This could result in a, a hesitation about being uh, too too specific. Let me see if there are any other. Let the let the tape delay run run down again for a second and see if there are any other comments questions. I, I have too many. I'll 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 help myself to to one more. Um, the way that how to put it. Uh, to what extent could you you sort of see? Um, it's a better way to phrase this. Sorry. Uh, how driven was the academic discussion by the sort of blow by blow day to day? Um, you know. Today, X country closed its borders, Y country, you know, Y university shut down, et cetera, et cetera. Was the, was the cycle sort of news forced in that way? Or was there, was it more kind of organically arising from the academic community? I would say, and again, in this data set, it was more kind of organic and, and more at a meta level. Um, it, it was kind of co people commenting on experiences of disruption rather than the, the kind of step-by-step -step processes uh, of disruption. This I would just say and acknowledge again is another kind of gap in my analysis because I haven't looked in any detail at the kind of temporal aspects and, and the way in which particular themes uh, emerge, partly because it's a kind of small data set and I'm not sure there's enough to, uh, to look at that. Um, it, but I think it would be extremely interesting to do so. Um, but I think this is also perhaps something about these, these, these norms. Um, so rather than just reporting what is happening, you have to make some kind of, again, this ironic distance commentary. Um, so you make a video um, promoting your new online um, lecture course in the style of a Hollywood video, or you tell a joke about your kids coming in and disturbing your, your Zoom meeting. Um, so it is at this kind of level and somewhat taking for granted the actual step-by-step -step, um, development of, of the pandemic. The, uh, the library takeout theme song from the Duke University Libraries, absolute jam. If you haven't seen it, it's a, it's a jam. 
Um, and yeah, that kind of that kind of that kind of production, it really it really is something. Uh, with that, we are we are at time. So thank you very much. This was a fantastic talk. I'm really interested to see. Uh, uh, I can't wait to see what 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 else you're going to be able to do with this data set. I think it's a really cool opportunity, uh, as you say. It's it's a it's a great moment, and I, I hope we'll have a lot a lot to learn from it. I think. Um, so thank you so much for sharing it with us. Yeah, thank you so much, and thank you everybody for their comments. With that, uh, we have a ten minute break now, so I'll see you back in ten minutes for the last uh, for the last uh, block of two talks. Okay, so I can leave, right? <laughs>